obtaining the prize. I'm going to take my text from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. I'll read from the New King James Version. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Obtaining the prize. Obtaining the prize. Apostle Paul planted the church in Corinth. He was the pioneer trailblazer for the church in Corinth. The city of Corinth was populated by Greeks, Romans, and those that were, you know, Orientals. Also, there were men and women who loved freedom. Men and women that we are all restrained, who flocked into Corinth. They saw Corinth as a melting point because Corinth was a liberal society. A liberal society that accepted all manner of sexual perversion as a way as a lifestyle so those that we are given to such inclination saw current as a place to be in current was also the largest commercial city of greece that made current to have some wealthy men and women but the wealthy we are in the minority the poor was in the majority unfortunately the evil practices that were prevalent in the society of Corinth found its way into the church brought in by the converts. The wealthy members of the church of Corinth were proud and stingy. That was responsible for church, for the, I mean for Paul and Barnabas when they came to establish that church, they refused to be sustained by the church. Paul and Barnabas opted to work with their hands to sustain themselves because they did not want the wealthy members of that church to use the opportunity of sustaining them to bring down the efficacy of the gospel. So they decided to sustain themselves. Paul was a tent maker. He was a craftsman. So he used his hands making tents in order to sustain himself. Even at that he was derided. He was conned by those wealthy elites that were members of the church in Corinth. 
because the Greeks looked down on people that used their hands to make a living. You know, the Greeks saw every other civilization as barbaric. They were the only ones that they felt were civilized and sophisticated. In their language, in their culture, everything. If it was not Greek, then it was primitive. Such was the pride of the Greek civilization and people. So Paul had a very difficult task. Planting and nurturing the church in Corinth. You know, when people think that they are very intelligent and they look down on every other person, it is difficult to teach them. They will not be teachable. Before you can teach them, you need every wisdom and patience that you can monster. You can muster. So that was what Paul was faced with when he was writing this epistle to the church in Corinth. Paul, as an effective writer, chose a familiar and cherished subject matter, the subject matter of athletics, as a medium to communicate to the church in Corinth a very difficult but important spiritual matter. He wanted to communicate it in a way that they will accept, more so when he was not physically present with them. So he chose to communicate it through a subject matter that they were familiar with and they loved, and that was athletics. Isthmus was a place in Corinth where one of the four games that was known as the Panhelic Games, we had four Panhelic Games in the Greek civilization. Those were games that held periodically. The Olympian game from where you got the present day Olympics. We had that as a game. The Olympian was a celebration that happened every four years. I think that is still the norm today. Then you have the Python game. You have the Nemian game. Then you have the Ismian game. These were the four games. While the Olympian held at Ellis, the Pythian held at Delphi, the Nemian held at Agolis, while the Isthmian held at Corinth. So the Corinthians were very familiar with this game. The Isthmian game was every two years. It was more frequent than others because two years before the Olympics, two years after the Olympics. So, so it was a very popular game. More popular than the Pythian and the Nemian. Only the Olympics or the Olympian then, as it was known, was more popular than the Isthmian game. So the Corinthians were very familiar with that game. So he decided to communicate with them through the metaphors that he used with those athletics events. So that was what was responsible for the way he was speaking. In the scripture we read as our text, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. So you saw the language of athletics, both 
race and boxing used by Paul. It was deliberate. The principles that Paul used to communicate to the church in Corinth, they are salient today as they were even for the Corinth church. So we are not here to just look at what Paul communicated to the church at Corinth. We are here to learn from the same salient principles today as a church. So I want you to please appreciate that. So we are going to look at those principles. The first principle we are going to be looking at you will see in verse 24 of that scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, in verse 24. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. 24b. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Obtain what? Obtain the prize. So the first principle we are going to be looking at is the objective, the right objective. That's the first principle. When you are in any race, any endeavor, it is important to have the right objective. When you have the right objective, then you are likely to succeed. For the athletes, those of them that had the right objective, they strove to obtain a perishable crown. A perishable crown. For us, as believers, we will strive to obtain imperishable crown. The perishable crown of those athletes. For example, for the Olympian game, they got a wreath. A, the wreath they got was made of olive tree. Olive. That is the wreath they got as a crown. That is the crown for the Olympian game. Then for the Python game, their own was the laurel wreath. The laurel was their own wreath. Then for the Namian, their own wreath was the wild celery. While for the Ismian, they had the pine wreath. From the pine tree, they got their own wreath. But all the wreaths of all the four games were perishable. These were plants. They lasted at best a few days and they withered. But for these perishable wreaths, these men will train rigorously for months to be able to qualify even to compete in those games. The games... We are very prestigious. Not anybody could qualify. Even today, you know, to qualify for the Olympics is a big deal. The mere fact that you qualify for the Olympics is a big deal. So it was even at that time. But Paul was saying, even with the right objective, with everything they did, what they got was a perishable crown. A perishable crown. But we are striving to get an imperishable crown. And what is our imperishable crown? The crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness is our imperishable crown. You can see that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. 
I have fought the good fight, Paul was saying. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid off for me the crown of righteousness. With the Lord, the righteous judge will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Please, I want you to take note. All those who have loved his appearing. Those that are waiting anxiously. Look, if you are waiting for the master, it means you are doing the work of the master. If you are not, you won't wait for him. You won't look forward to his coming. You know how it is when parents leave the home and they tell children to do stuff. If you are a child and you've not done what your parents told you to do, you went playing, you wild, you wild away your time. When you hear that your father, your mother is coming back, what do you do? You panic. You want to hide. But assuming you've done everything well, you look forward to your parent coming back. You will even be looking at, hey, when is it? Every noise, every car, you, oh, is it my dad? Is it my mom? Because you want them to come and see what you have done. You're proud of your achievement. That's how it's going to be. Those that have done what the master has said that they should do, we look forward to his appearing. Those that have not done so, we not look forward to his appearing. And for those that have done what he has told them to do, they have a gift waiting for them. The crown of righteousness. Hallelujah. So you can see, that the right motive will enable you to get the crown. The right objective. Then you also have the wrong objective. Even among those that you may see. You will know still that some have the wrong objective. For example. You might look at some people. Every morning, running. Not everybody is running for a competitive sports. Am I correct? While some athletes that are into competitive athlete, um, competition, they will train for hours every day. But there are some with wrong motives, wrong objective. You will see them they are running for the fun of it. Some run for the fun of it. That reminds me of a story told by a man of God. He went to observe his niece who was, you know, engaged in a competitive sport. So he went to cheer her and to encourage her. But you see, when he got there, this niece of his, was involved in a number of those athletic events. Number one event, she came last. Number two, she came last. Number three, she came last. Number four, she came last. The man was embarrassed. And he noticed that she was not putting any effort. She was just leisurely coming last. So he had to call her because there were some other events still remaining. She called her. He said, come my dear niece. Do you know if you put some effort, you may not come last. The man was not even saying confess. <laughs> but don't stop just coming last because each time you come last, they will call your name. <laughs> and that's your name they call. <laughs> of course, reminds me of myself. <laughs> So, trying to encourage her not to come last, the girl was shocked. Why are you telling me to put such and put more effort? I thought we were here to have fun with our friends. Oh, the man said, now I know why you have been coming last. Wrong objective. She was there just to have fun while others were there for the recompetition. So there are some you will see every day 
just having fun. They are not uh, competitive athletes. There are other people you may see every morning running. They are not competitive athletes. They are there just trying to exercise and shed some calories. So when you see them, you see that these ones, <laughs> they are not serious. Maybe they're just there. You see, is that how they're going to run in Olympics? They're just running like this. They're just trying to shed weight. While the real athletes, you see them, they are serious. They will time themselves. They will you know, work hard so that they can beat some records. But those that are just trying to shed weight, when you see them running, you will know them. They will just be running leisurely. You will know them. So there are different people with different objectives. That's for the athletes. But when you come to believers, you will discover there are also some believers with wrong objectives. There are believers with wrong objectives. The believers with right objective, you will know them. The believers with right objective, that the ones you will see, they will take their Bible study seriously. They will take their prayer seriously. They will take their ministry seriously. Everything about them, you will notice. It, is, it will be different. The believers with wrong objective, you will notice them also. They are in the church, maybe just for connections, to make connections. Marriage connection, or business connection, or social connection. Some of them are there just for the miracle. Once they get the miracle, they go out. Some of them are there in the church just for, you know, what you, for the records. They are nominal Christians. They want to look decent and responsible in the eye of the society. So they put themselves in a church. So that when you ask them, say, yes, I am a Christian. I'm a member of so, 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 so church. Wrong objective. But if you want to succeed, you must have the right objective. So that was one principle that Paul was bringing out to this church in Corinth that was very difficult to teach. Another principle Paul taught them and Paul is teaching us through that epistle was discipline or self-control. Discipline or self-control. You see that in verse 25. In verse 25 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Temperate in all things. That tells you about self-control. Tells you about discipline. The athletes that are serious, that are competing for the prize, they are temperate in all things. They don't eat anyhow. They watch their food. They watch their drink. You won't see them eating anyhow. You won't see them drinking anyhow. They are temperate in everything they do. The kind of food they eat, they choose. The kind of drink they take, they choose carefully. What they take in, what, that, what will nourish them, will be carefully chosen. They observe healthy sleep hygiene. Competitive athletes, you don't see them sleep at any time. They sleep at recommended time, Catch recommended hours of sleep and wake at recommended time. They have a healthy sleep hygiene. 
competitive athletes are careful about what they listen to, the news they hear, the information they imbibe. They are careful about such things. You won't see them in the social media just, you know, scavenging, looking for whatever that is there. No, 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 no. You won't see them doing that because that they are trained to be mindful of what enters their mind. I read about the regiment of Carl Lewis, the Olympian champion. The American Olympian champion in those um, 90s, 80s, thereabout. Carl Lewis, you know him? Good. He won so many gold medals. His manager and trainers will take him to a camp before every major event. He will remain there isolated. No television, no radio. No newspapers. They will select the newspapers that he will read. The newspapers that he will read will have been newspapers of those that will praise him and talk highly about him and talk about his, you know, strength, his prowess, and how he was going to defend his gold medals. So when he will read those things, those things will motivate him, encourage him. They will never allow him to hear people trashing him, talking down on him. They will never allow him to listen to his critics that will want to pull him down, that are careful about what he hears, what enters his mind. These are men that strive for perishable crowns. How much more should the believers be careful about what they eat? How much more should the believers be careful about their sleep hygiene? About what they hear, what they look at? Are there no believers that spend more of their time on social media than they spend on the Bible? Are there no believers like that? If you are striving for the imperishable crown, you must be careful what you do. You must be careful what you do. So that you can await his coming. When you hear that he's coming, you will look forward to his coming with joy. You will not be ashamed of yourself. You will not say, hey, let him wait a little. Let me tidy up things. Obtaining the prize should be so important that nothing else will matter to you. So if these athletes will go to such great extent to discipline themselves, subject themselves to all manner of things in order to succeed, how much more should we as believers? Another thing you will see from that text we read, another principle You will see there is how they train themselves, exercise themselves. Training and exercise. For the athletes, they subject themselves to hours of training. In that scripture we read, you will see we are in verse 27. Paul was saying, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. In other words, if you're supposed to wake up by 6 a.m. and the, the rain is falling and you are enjoying your sleep by 6 a.m., you must wake up. 
He will say, no, 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 no. This is the time to go under the blanket and cover myself very well and block my ears. No, you must wake up. If you don't want to wake up, your trainer will come yank away the, the blanket and give you a hard kick. Jump up or else I'll pour cold water upon you. You will jump up. If you refuse to jump up, they'll pour ice water on you. You must jump up and train because you've signed the contract that they should ensure you don't miss your training. They are paid to ensure that you don't miss your training. That pay to train you and they must train you to win. Training and exercise. So you see them exercising for hours when they want to go into competitive athletics. Hours of exercise. Eight hours, seven hours daily exercising running exercising their muscles building their muscles their stamina making sure they remain competitive you don't want to lower your standard during song you are training during the rain you are training during the snow they are training whatever the weather may be they are training every day they are training So that they can remain competitive. For us believers, do you know you are expected to so train yourself? Study the word of God. Meditate on the word of God. You are expected to fast and pray. You are expected to be effective in your ministry. Look at the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of the truth. That is what God expects of you. In Colossians chapter 3, 16. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. That is the discipline required of you. Then in Joshua chapter 1, 8, Joshua chapter 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. You study the word of God. You meditate on the word of God. You allow the word of God to richly dwell in you. You don't joke with anything. That's exactly what God expects us to do. Why? Because we are striving for an imperishable crown. An imperishable crown. A crown that will last forever and ever. A crown of glory. Eternal crown. A crown that whenever you wear it, peace, joy will flow through you. Peace you've never known. Joy you've never known. Not the way you feel here on earth, but a special way you will feel in heaven. For all time. That is the crown you are striving for. The crown of righteousness. With the Lord, the righteous joy will give to you, will give to me. Hallelujah. So if we are striving for an imperishable crown, we must be serious to obtain the prize. And to do that, you must stand for righteousness. Do not stand aloof. Do not stand aloof. Don't remove yourself. Stand for righteousness. 
in Matthew chapter 5 verse 10 Matthew chapter 5 verse 10 the word of God tells us blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven many of us we remove ourselves when unbelievers are trashing the word of God trashing the people of God you some of you will join them they make mockery of pastors you keep quiet sometimes you even join them in laughing they make mockery of believers you keep quiet you don't even want them to know that you are a believer because of that you have never revealed who you are in your place of work maybe your boss is anti you know christ he talks down on everything christ so you don't want him to know that you are a christian so even when he's making mockery of christ of the bible of christianity you'll be giggling you'll be laughing let me tell you the bible says blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven that is the word of god In the beatitude, the word blessed means to be approved of God. That's the meaning of this word blessed as it is used in the beatitude. Approved of God are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. So when you refuse to identify with God and righteousness, you are telling God, I don't need your approval. That's what you're saying. To obtain the prize, you must stand for righteousness. Even if they make more clear of you, that should not be of your, you know, concern. You shouldn't break your head over that. They made mockery of your Lord and Master. Who are you not to be made mockery of? Who am I not to be made mockery of? To be able to obtain the prize, do not oppose righteousness. If we want to obtain the crown of righteousness, do not oppose righteousness. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Having faith and good conscience, which some haven't rejected, concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck of whom are Hymenus and Alexander whom I deliver to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme these were men that oppose righteousness men that were blasphemous just like Janus and Jambres did in the Old Testament. If you read 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, 1 Timothy, I mean 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, you will see the same thing said. Now as Janus and Jambre resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith. But they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. Do not oppose righteousness. Do not join men like this. Again, do not turn away from righteousness. Don't start and stop and turn away. Some have started well, but eventually you, you won't recognize them. There was one great man of God that brought up so many men of God. But do you know what? This man of God, midway in his life and ministry, he dropped his Bible. And he became an atheist. Can you imagine that? A great man of God that brought so many people to the faith and raised so many people 
suddenly said that he didn't believe in God. And he did not only do that, he became so antagonistic to the faith and to the people of God. What a shame. Don't be like that. Don't turn away from righteousness. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 15, 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 15, the word of God says, for some have already turned aside after Satan. Some that we are known as believers, they've already turned away, aside, they've turned aside after Satan. You may see them in the church, but they're no more following God, they're not following Satan. Along the line, they entered into some difficulty. They didn't believe in the God that saved them. They turned to Satan. They ended up in the house of occultists. They ended up in the houses of native doctors. Native doctors are now the ones guiding them, telling them what to do and what not to do. If you are in that situation, you had better repent and come back to God. Or else, you are going to face damnation. Some have already turned aside after Satan. That was the problem of Judas. If you read the book of Luke chapter 22, Luke 22 verse 3 and 4. Luke 22 verse 3 and 4. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. This was somebody privileged to be chosen by Jesus. To be one of the twelve. Can you imagine such a rare privilege? But he turned aside and Satan entered into him. And he did the unthinkable. He betrayed God the Son. He sold him for 30 pieces of silver. What did he do with the 30 pieces? Nothing. Eventually, he could not even use those 30 pieces. They were too hot in his hands. He had to throw them away. But it was too late for him. It was too late. Because his conscience was already seared. He threw away every opportunity of grace, every love Jesus showed him, every prayer he wasted. So when he threw away the money, he didn't even know how to go back to ask for forgiveness. He went and killed himself. He was used to listening to the voice of Satan. When you have communion with Jesus and you have the privilege to hear from God and God communes with you, God speaks to you through his word and after God has spoken to you, you now obey Satan. Do you know what you're saying? You are saying to God, I, I, I cannot hear you. I can't hear you. You know, we pray this morning, may we not be hearers of the word alone, may we also be doers. It's when you hear and obey that you will qualify. Judas had so much from Jesus, but he took nothing home. He didn't internalize the words of Jesus Christ. He didn't meditate on the word. He was not diligent to obey them. He was not diligent to put them into his mind. But whatever Satan told him, he did. Why with Jesus, he was still stealing money from the purse. Jesus showed him love. Jesus did not embarrass him. Jesus tried his best to make him to repent, but he refused. Whatever Satan said, he obeyed. Whatever Jesus said, he will never obey. So at the critical moment, it was also the voice of Satan he listened. Satan told him, end it all. Kill yourself. Because he was used to the voice of Satan, he obeyed and killed himself. And ended up into Christless eternity. May that not be your portion in Jesus' name. To obtain the prize, you must be diligent.
diligent to obey the word of God. In our society today, you know that there are so many things that people are saying to contradict the word of God. If you listen to those blasphemies, those heresies, you will have yourself to blame. There are many Christians today, they've been deceived. You see them, they take things that are outside the Bible, they hold it tenaciously. When you say, no, 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 I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. I, I. They speak the language of Satan. Lucifer. I, I. That was what drove him away from heaven. Unfortunately, when it is all about you, what you think, I, I don't believe in this. I, no, 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 you can't convince me on this. No, 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 no. As far as I'm concerned, as far as I am concerned, I, I, I. You say, but look at what Jesus is saying. No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't tell me that. This is what I think. This is how I see it. I have sense. I have sense. When it is all about I, 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 be careful. Be careful. To obtain the prize, you must believe the Lord. The very one that is going to give you the crown of righteousness, you must trust him. Trust and obey. For there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That song is true. That song is true. We thank God for Paul. What he spoke to the church in Corinth, he's speaking to us today. Do you know that Paul understood the problem of the church in Corinth? Remember that later on, Jesus gave revelation to John the Apostle. The revelation was about the situation of the seven churches in Asia Minor. Those seven churches, they represent all the churches today. There is no church in existence today that you will not find something about that church among the seven churches. The seven churches were representative of all the churches in this world. All the churches that have ever existed, including the church in Corinth. If you go and look at the letters to the seven churches, you will see the letter to the church in Pergamum. When you look at the letter to the church in Pergamum, you will see their problem. That church, though the congregation was upholding the faith, the congregation. But there were some amongst them. There were some amongst them that were pervasive. They decided to bring in things from outside. And Jesus was telling them through that letter that they should repent. Let me tell you, even if in your church, some people decide to go left. Don't follow them and go left. If the word of God is telling you to go right. Amen? Amen. The city of Pergamon was renowned for its pagan practices. The church of Pergamon itself upheld the faith. Despite the city's perversion, they refused to succumb. But there were some in the church that easily embraced the perversion of the city. And Jesus was warning them. That was the church in Pergamum. Do you know the same thing happened to the church in Corinth? The Corinthian church was also faced with such perversion. 
there were all kinds of immoral activities, sexual perversion that was prevalent in the city of Corinth. They had shrines and temples where temple prostitutes that were called priestesses reigned supreme. Immorality was nothing to them. That was why you saw, even in the church, things like incest crept in and they were comfortable with it. Incest crept in and they didn't care. Paul was warning them, be careful. Be careful. Again, if you look at the church in Laodicea, the letter to the church in Laodicea, you will see what happened. Laodicea was a prosperous, industrious, you know, and commercial place. So they were wealthy. They had money. But what happened? Their money entered their head. And they thought they could water down the gospel. And take the one that suits them and reject the one that does not suit them. After all, they were comfortable. They were not praying for what to eat. They were not praying for where to live. They were prosperous. And God was warning them. God said, you have become lukewarm. He said that you are hot or you are cold. If you're lukewarm, you are as well as being cold. I will spit you out. Don't we have people like that today? Don't we? You tell them to come for prayers. What are they coming for prayer for? God has buttered their bread. Sugar their tea. Those of you that don't have your rent, go and pray. Those of you that are tenants, go and pray. They are landlords. They have houses. If the church wants money, the church can come. They will give some donation. Pastor, what do you need? Write your list and please let me have. Are there not some people who are paying people to pray for them now? And some people have now turned to prayer merchants. Some have opened ministries to pray for those that cannot pray. Those that don't have time to pray. So they pay some people who have time to pray for them. What an insult to God. That was the church in Laodicea. God said, you are lukewarm. I will spit you out. He said that you're hot or you're cold. You don't sit on the fence with God. Are you a child of God? You're sitting on the fence. When it is convenient for you, you obey God. When it is not convenient, you don't obey him. The same thing God told the church in Laodicea, God is telling you today. You had better be hot. Or he will spit you out. To obtain the prize, we must strive for the crown of righteousness. I don't know where you are. I don't know who you are. Maybe you have backslidden in your heart. And you know it. You are a backslider. You are lukewarm now. Once upon a time, you used to be hot. Maybe that was when you were looking for a job. You didn't have any work. You were praying as if your life depended on it. But God has given you a job. Promotions have come. You have been lifted. You are no more jumping from one keke to the other. You now have your own cars. So now you don't know what it means to pray again. Before you pray, maybe there is food before you and your prayer is a one sentence prayer. God bless this food. Amen. And you eat and you go away. 
Are you in that position now? You had better repent. I don't know where you are. Have you hardened your heart over something that God is telling you is wrong? You are a child of God. But you are living an immoral life. So much so, you don't feel it anymore. You are camping a woman. You are having an affair. And you are not even trembling. You've conditioned yourself to it. You come to church. They will preach. You will hear. But it will fly over your head. Please don't be like Judas. Judas had fellowship with Jesus. But Judas still ended up in a disaster. Don't be like Judas. Judas went with others to go and save people. Preach Jesus. They accepted Jesus. Healed the sick. Laid hands on the sick. They recovered. Cast out demons. Yet Judas was destroyed by demons. What a shame. He allowed Satan to enter into him. How did that happen? It happened by consistent rejection of the word of God. All the opportunities that were given to Judas, he threw away. He thought that he had eternity as opportunities. No, grace has expiration date. One day, your grace will expire. May your grace not expire Amen. when you are yet to be restored. Amen. Today is an opportunity for you. I cannot tell you how important this opportunity is. I cannot tell you. But very soon you may recognize how important it is. What you hear me say now, you may never hear me say again. Let's stand on our feet to pray. Obtaining the prize. Obtaining the prize. I want us to talk to the Lord in prayer. I want us to be resolved. We will not go the way of perdition. We will not go the way of Judas. We will not go the way of Alexander. We will not go the way of Hymenaeus. We will not go the way of Janus and Jambres. We will be like David. When David was confronted with his sin, he repented. He humbled himself. Talk to the Lord. His grace is available for you even now. Talk to him. Talk to him. Lift up your voice. Cry out to God. He's willing and ready to rescue you. Talk to him.
you need to do is to ask him for forgiveness. Sincerely ask him for forgiveness. He will forgive you. Commit yourself into his hands. He will take you back. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Talk to him. In Jesus holy and mighty name we pray Amen. keep me true Lord Jesus keep me true keep me true keep me true Lord Jesus keep me true I must run Oh yes, oh yes Oh yes Oh yes He's releasing that power to you now. I want you to appropriate that power. I want you to appropriate that power. He's releasing that power to you. You ask for power, he's giving you power now. To be true to him. Receive that power to be true. Receive that power to be true. No room for duplicity. No room for hypocrisy. Receive the power to be true. True and true you will be. Receive that power now. Hmm. Baba Bakuba. Malabobo Sheki Baba Kuski. Babo Sheki Lamboski Hinga Gagagagaga. Kubari kama kuba hanga gaba kuba ba. Hmm. Kumparinga gama majiki la gaba ba kuba ba. Rupa kaka makuski zanta hinga gaba kuba ba. Rakapa kupa hanga jikiski zanga la laga buski. Rumba hinga la laga buski jikiski zanga la laga bakuba. Ramba baba kuski zanta linga gaga jikiski zanga la laga baba kuski zanta. Thank you Lord, thank you Father. Glory be to your holy name. In Jesus' holy and mighty name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you for giving us power to be true. True to you, true to ourselves, true to our generation, true to our family. Thank you, Lord. True to hell. Hell will see us and know that we are true. When our names are mentioned, hell shall tremble. Amen. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. Amen. We'll receive power today to be humble. Amen. We'll humble ourselves before you. No power, no demon will hold us back. Amen. We've received power to be true. Amen. Yes, we've received power to be true. Thank you, Abba Father. You have received that power. You have appropriated that power. 
listen to me please if you have received that power if you have appropriated that power if you have prayed and you've asked the lord for forgiveness from every sin from every backsliding and today you have prayed that prayer wherever you are i want you to raise your right hand up i want to pray for you now raise your right hand up i want you to know you're not raising those hands to me you're raising them to the lord god will strengthen you you'll be true indeed If you pray that prayer, you had better raise your right hand up with these ones and identify with that your prayer. And heaven will crown your request. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. All these, your children that have raised their hands, Lord, you have seen them. I pray you will attend unto them. Let their heart desires be met by heaven. Let them be true and true indeed. Amen. Let them be true and true indeed. Amen. Whatever it was, we remain in the past. Amen. As from today, it will be forward ever. Amen. And backward never. Amen. It will be forward ever. Amen. And backward never. May they run to obtain the prize. May they not miss the prize. May they obtain the crown of righteousness. Thank you, Abba Father. Glory be to your holy name. In Jesus' holy and mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Once again, may I remind all the seed partners that I will be meeting with you on the 28th day of August, Sunday, the 28th day of August, by 2 p.m. here at Shepherd's Hill. Please do not forget. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. We are going to worship the Lord in appreciation of what he has done for us and with us. Amen. We are going to have two thanksgivings. The one is the special Thanksgiving, one is special Thanksgiving for the 2022 or Denise or Denise. Then, if you want to clap, you clap. Then there is the general Thanksgiving. I think we take the general Thanksgiving first, then we take the special Thanksgiving. Amen? All right. Let us. Choir, you will lead us. We take the general thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Excellent Jehovah. Marvelous Jehovah. Please, there is no wait, one greater. Please wait. Let me please advise you. This is not a general offering. It is an offering of thanksgiving. If there is nothing God has done for you, worthy of thanksgiving you don't need to give this um, thanksgiving offering 
Only those that God has done something for, those that know they have something to thank God for, that are the ones that will participate in this thanksgiving. And I will encourage you to give to the Lord richly. Give to the Lord liberally. Give, the, give to the Lord with a cheerful heart. Don't give to the Lord grudgingly. For the Lord loves a cheerful giver. If you're still reluctant, you can keep the, your offering until when you know how or why you should give a thanksgiving offering. So please, for those of us who know that God has done something for us, not just in this meeting, but even outside this meeting, we have something to thank God for. May we please rise on our feet. Choir, please, you can lead us. We still have another 
special thanksgiving. All right. Praise the Lord. The special thanksgiving by the 2022 Odenese. For this year, 2022, eight full pastors we are ordained. Eleven assistant pastors we are ordained. And 70 deacons and deaconesses we are ordained. Praise the Lord. So we are going to have them give their thanksgiving. That's a total of 89. Am I correct? All right. So let them come out for their thanksgiving. Let's see them. Father, to...
Are you people confused? Eh? All right, good. That's the number. I've counted it before you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. You are supposed to be 89. And 59 are here. How many of you are absent? Eh? 30. That's huge, isn't it? On the day of your Thanksgiving, 30 are absent. What will you do when you are not thanking God? All right. I will not say anything today. Today is not a day to say something. What I won't say will be louder than what I will have said. Let us pray. Please, I want us to rise on our feet. Stretch forth your hands towards them. Pray that God will help them to succeed. That this ordination will not be a ritual for them. It will not be mere titled for them. Hmm. Bakuba, kuba, bakuba, bahiga, gahiga, bakushi, kila, gababa. In Jesus' holy and mighty name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you. You are the one that calls. You are the one that equips. You are the one that gives grace. You are the one that covers with your love. Thank you for all these ones. Our prayer, Lord, is that as from now, let there be a difference in their lives. Amen. Let there be a difference in their ministry. Amen. May hell identify them as the ones you have branded. Amen. May they be too hot for the enemy to handle. Amen. May their words not fall to the ground. Amen. Father, I pray for their sake, heaven will stand at attention. Amen. For their sake, hell will tremble. Amen. May all that you said concerning them come to pass. Amen. When they lay hands on the sick, may the sick recover. Amen. May they cast out demons. Amen. Through their ministries, may we see mighty miracles. Amen. May these ones bring multitude of souls to the Lord. Amen. They shall succeed. Amen. They shall not fail. Amen. They shall not draw back. Amen. The crown of righteousness shall be their lot. Amen. Thank you, Abba Father. Receive them, receive their thanksgiving. Amen. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. You want to? Oh, okay, you will have um, a gift for the project. All right. The Lord will... Praise the Lord. All right. So they have given an envelope. The envelope is not flat. I love flat envelopes. But this one is not flat. But we thank God because it entered their hearts to support the project. 
By the grace of God, we have come this far in the project. And what we have started, we shall finish. Yes. And we shall finish well in Jesus' name. Yes. The Lord will bless where this has come from. Yes. The Lord will multiply your resources. Yes. You will never lack. Yes. What you started, you will finish. Yes. So shall it be in Jesus' name. Yes. All right. So give to the um, ushers to record it and put it in the register. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I want to use this opportunity to thank you as a province for the support that you gave me when I called on you for the project of re-roofing this place and building toilets for us. And you responded. I want to assure you you will not lose your labor of love. Please, if you made a pledge for that project, do your possible best to redeem it before the end of this month. Do your possible best to redeem it before when we are entering the new church year by 1st of September. Don't carry it over to the new year. You know yourself, we have the records, but we are not going to talk to you we know you also, but there are a few of you we don't know because you did not put your name, but heaven knows you and you know yourself. Please, if you are in that category, make sure you don't carry this vow, pledge to the new church year. Let it be done in this church year, this church year that is about to end. So do everything within your power to redeem your pledge, to pay your vow before the end of 31st of August. I think August is 31st before the 31st, on or before the August 31st. The Lord will give you the enablement. Amen. I say the Lord will give you the enablement. Amen. And the Lord will bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. In the new church year, you will reap multiple of harvest. Amen. This new church year we are about to enter, will be a year of bumper harvest for you. May nothing stand in the way of your bumper harvest. May nothing stand in the way. The Lord will bless you as you do so in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. I think we are done for the day. All right. May we please rise on our feet. <clears throat> I want you to thank God 
for how far he has led us for this year. Just thank him. Spend some moment thanking him. Thank him for taking us to the camp, bringing us back safely. Many traveled by road. Some traveled by air. Some traveled by sea. God protected everyone. Took us safely, brought us safely back. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to your holy name. In Jesus' holy and mighty name we pray. Before we go, I would like you to pray concerning our land that is in dispute. Project Glory land that is being contested by someone that does not own the land. Take it from me on good authority that we own this land. And whether the devil likes it or not, God will bring back our land. So I want you to stretch forth your hands toward that land and pray. And ask God to expedite the court cases. And that the Lord will grant us justice. Let justice prevail. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Hmm. In Jesus' holy and mighty name we pray. Amen. Father, we receive all your favor with thanksgiving. Amen. For what you have done. For what you are doing. And what you will yet do. Amen. We say thank you. Amen. Glory be to your holy name. We shall rejoice over what you will do over this land. Yeah. We believe that soon and very soon we shall sing a new song. Yeah. The song of victory. Yeah. And it shall be permanent. Yeah. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Thank you, Abba Father. Glory be to your holy name. As we go, we go in your name. It is our prayer that through your grace we shall obtain the prize. May no one here miss the prize. May we all obtain the prize. So shall it be in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Let's share the grace in fellowship. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us now forevermore. Amen. Surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. The Lord will continue to bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. When you knock at one door, several shall open unto you. Amen. When you call, so many will answer you. Amen. You will not lack help. Amen. His grace shall envelop you. Amen. His favor shall be your lot. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Please 
I want you, those of you at the middle, don't bother to 